For this video, I set out to create a design for a fretted cigar box guitar made from nothing but parts that can be found in a single trip to a hardware store. The only exception is the actual cigar box. Most tobacco shops will sell these empty for two or three dollars. I start with a length of maple to create the neck, though other hardwoods like oak could also be used. This board measures two and a half by three quarters of an inch thick, which are the actual dimensions of what is sold as a one by three plank. This board is measured and marked for the full length of the neck, including the headstock. In this case, that will be 32 inches. This measurement assumes a five and a half inch headstock, 24 inches total for the scale length, and an extra two and a half inches of board extending past the bridge. These small corner brackets will be used to mount the tuners to the headstock. So before I start shaping the neck, I need to mark a line at two inches to be sure I leave enough room for the brackets to screw in later. Five and a half inches from the end is where the headstock will stop and the neck begin, so another line is scratched in here. This second line is also where the 24 inch scale length will begin, so precisely 24 inches further down the board, another line is marked where it will end. This is the most important measurement to get right on the whole instrument so we can double check it as we move on. For three strings, the neck should be narrowed down to about an inch and a half wide. So starting where the headstock will end, two measurements are made to reach an inch and a half between them. Since I think an offset headstock is aesthetically pleasing, I'll be taking three quarters of an inch off of one side and one quarter off of the other. These same marks are repeated a few more times down the length of the neck, so lines can be stretched between them. The shape of the headstock can be sketched out with a bit of artistic freedom, so long as it tapers down to the width of the parallel lines by the time they intersect with the marks made at the start of the scale length. We also can't change anything past the first line that was made to leave room for the tuning brackets. Now at the other end, the neck is set onto whatever cigar box has been chosen as the body so a mark can be made approximately where the neck will intersect with the edge. I added about a half inch of extra space onto this measurement, better to have excess here than to later find out that the wide portion is too short for the box. As a visual reference, I've also marked where the 12th fret of the guitar will rest which is the exact midpoint of the 24 inch scale length. Between these two lines, I can freehand some curves to follow as a rough guide as to how I'd like this portion of the neck to be shaped. So long as I don't intersect with the 12th fret, any sort of spacing is acceptable. The tape measure can now be put away and we can begin work with a chisel. Starting at either end of the neck where a curve has been marked, the chisel is chipped in following the line. This is done slowly and in stages, occasionally rocking the blade back to pry at the grain. If the wood splits in strands that are parallel with the board or angled downwards, we need to stop working from that side and instead chip away in the opposite direction, starting from the opposing curve. If you're chipping from the correct direction, when the wood splits, it should be angled upwards towards the outside edge of the board. This will allow precise cuts to be made as I shave down to the final width of the neck without worrying about the wood splitting deeper into the board than I'd like. It can be difficult to get solid strikes on the chisel without bracing the board, either against a wall or something like these temporary blocks I've screwed into my workbench. It will take a few passes to shave off the bulk of the wood, and as each pass reaches the far curve, it should be cut down a little deeper along the line so the chips break off cleanly where they're supposed to. As we come closer to the parallel mark that indicates the final width of the neck, the shaving should be taken off more carefully so we can come right up to the edge or just short of it. 
The final smoothing and adjustments can be done with sandpaper after we've finished chiseling out the other side as well as the headstock. Cutting out such a small area as this curve on the headstock is done by alternating between both sides, being careful to cut deep enough before chipping out the center that the chips break free before splitting past the lines. A piece of plumbing pipe or any rounded object with some attached sandpaper makes a great tool to smooth this sort of curve, as well as the other curves we've cut further down the neck. Next I'll be installing the tuning brackets, but first, any marks or scratches on the back side of the headstock should be sanded off, and the corner rounded slightly so the brackets are a closer fit. With the brackets evenly spaced along the edge, marks are made for where holes for the screws will be tapped in with a small drill bit. This will relieve stress when first installing the screws that could otherwise split the board. A 4 inch eye bolt will be used in each bracket to act as a tuner, adjusting the tension on the strings by tightening a nut on the back. Where the headstock of a guitar ends and the scale begins, there is usually what is called a nut, a piece of hard plastic or bone on which the strings rest. I'll be doing things differently here by using these heavy fencing staples to create an individual guide for each guitar string. Marks are made along the neckline to indicate where holes should be tapped to guide the staples evenly into place. Again, this is done to reduce stress, and in this case, also to make sure the staples don't twist when tapped in. Before moving forward any further, now is the time to sand all the measuring marks off of this portion of the neck. Once done, the staples can be guided into the holes made for them. For now, they should be left at least a quarter inch above the surface. Carefully tapping them in deeper once the guitar is strung for the first time is how the string height over the fretboard will be adjusted. Now measuring from these staples, the 24 inch scale length is checked again to be sure we're exactly on the mark. Using a fine tooth file, a groove is carefully cut into this position across the width. The guitar's bridge, or what the strings will rest on on this side of the scale, will be set into the groove. I'll be using a brass door hinge pin as the bridge on this guitar, but a regular threaded bolt would work just as well. Now at the very base of the neck, three holes are drilled to loosely fit these short pins, or small nails, which will hold this side of each guitar string. If your goal is to make a fretless guitar, to be played primarily with a bottleneck or brass slide, the neck would now be complete as soon as all the remaining measurement marks had been sanded clean. I've decided to go all the way for this video in making a fretted instrument, so that's what I'll be getting into for the following steps. I input the 24 inch scale into an online fret calculator, and these are the measurements in inches that each fret is to be made distant from the start of the scale, which begins right in line with the three staples. To keep this measurement as precise as will be possible while using a hardware store tape measure, the end is taped to the headstock with the one inch line centered with the staples. Because we're starting at the one inch mark instead of zero, we'll have to add an extra inch to each written measurement to compensate, making the first mark at 2.347 and the following at 3.168 and so on. Since the marks on a tape measure are based on fractions, but the numbers output for calculating fret distances are decimals, you'll find it's necessary to round to the nearest closest fraction for making these measurements. This is far from ideal, but the results should be adequate. Assuming all measurements have been made correctly, the 12th fret will be exactly at the halfway point between either side of the scale. For each mark, a line is now stretched across the neck using a straight edge. In the same way that a groove was cut earlier for the bridge pin, a fine tooth file is again used to cut a shallow setting on each fret position to hold a 1.5 inch finishing nail. The groove is cut a little bit deeper at the very end to make room for the nail head to sit flush against the edge. As each groove is cut down the length of the neck, effort should be made to keep each cut as consistent a depth as possible, 
so that all the frets are the same height in the end. Ideally, the groove should allow the finishing nails to sit with half their diameter below the surface and half above. With every groove cut, all the remaining measurement marks can now be sanded away. An optional step at this point is to give the neck a coat of paste wax, which will create a nicer looking finish. Afterwards, it will be important to remove any wax from inside the fret grooves with another light filing before moving on, or glue may not stick. 12 1.5 inch finishing nails need to be prepared to be inlaid into the grooves as frets by first roughing up their surface with coarse sandpaper. A gel-based superglue is used to run a bead in the bottom of the first groove, and a prepared nail is quickly set in place. To hold it even more securely, another bead of glue should be run down either side. Laying the following frets is simply a repetition of this process. It's important to use a gel-based superglue rather than traditional liquid, which would simply absorb into the wood and not adhere well to the frets. After about a half hour of dry time, a combination of a sanding block and a file on the nail heads is used to level the surface of the frets. It doesn't take long to give them a nice smooth finish. With the bridge pin in place, the neck is now entirely finished. We can even put strings on at this point, starting by placing one of the pins at the base of the neck through the brass lock attached to each string then back into the neck to hold it in place. I'm using the three lowest strings from an acoustic guitar, but it could just as easily be strung with the higher strings to achieve a different sound. Now on the other side, the end of each string is fed through one of the staples, and then on through the eye bolt with which it's aligned. The string is pulled tight to give it a slight bend, and then fed under and around itself once to form a loop. The tail end is guided back through this loop, which should form a figure eight knot. One more time through for extra security should keep the string in place. The knots will look less messy once the tuners are tightened to add tension. This can first be done by hand and then with a wrench. With just enough tension on the strings that they no longer feel loose, the tails can be trimmed off and the action lowered, if desired, by tapping the staples in a little further. The last addition is to add a small block of wood below the strings on the headstock to create a sharper angle with the staples, which will eliminate buzzing for a cleaner sound. If you find that the strings are misaligned with the length of the neck, an easy fix is to tap guide pins just below the bridge, which should correct the issue. It's now time to prepare the cigar box. The neck is positioned wherever on the box it will look best without covering too much of the artwork, and a line is scratched down either side to mark where the center will need to be cut out. Cutting along a flat surface like this can be a challenge. It helps to start on an angle and cut from one side of the box to the other, rather than keeping the saw flat and trying to cut across the entire surface at once. If the box being used has loose wood inserts like these along the walls, they should be removed. The neck should now fit comfortably in place, but before gluing everything together, the last step is to cut a sound hole in the box. The sound hole can be any shape or size, and you can even have more than one if you'd like, but for this guitar, I'll keep it simple. After making an outline, I use a small drill bit to go around the perimeter. A razor blade or small saw is then used to cut between each hole to remove the center. Of course, if we had a drill bit or hole saw large enough to make the sound hole in one step, this wouldn't be necessary. The sides of the hole are smoothed again with sandpaper on a length of pipe and finished off by hand. The hinged side of the box can now be glued to the base with more super glue gel. A bead of glue is then laid down where the neck will sit, and it also can be put into position and held for about 10 minutes while the glue dries. Once the far side of the box is in position, held with even more super glue, the guitar is now complete. 
tuning is done with a wrench by adjusting the nut on the end of each eye bolt. There are dozens of different tunings that could be used, especially if the guitar is strung with lighter strings, but I like standard EAD or drop D for most purposes. This has been the most detailed project I've ever filmed, so if you've made it this far in the video, I'd really appreciate a like and comment, and if you could share this video with your friends as well. You can support my channel further by checking out my sponsor, lynda.com forward slash Nighthawk. If you're looking to learn about videography or audio production in particular, their videos are the best around, and they have many topics to choose from. If you sign up for a free trial through the link below, they'll know I sent you. And that'll really go a long way to help support my own videos. Thanks for watching.